Hello, welcome to Let's Talk with Dr. Michelle. I'm Dr. Michelle. This is the first of a new podcast, and we're going to share facts with you about the state of affairs in California as it relates to our broken mental health laws and those suffering with their families because of it. Today, I want to talk to you about a few important topics as we share our stories. We're going to be discussing suicide prevention. We're going to be discussing the importance of removing the stigma of those suffering silently with mental illness because they are afraid what others will think and say about them. But let's start with the California LPS Act, how it affects families of loved ones with mental illness and how it affects the mentally ill homeless population, which is absolutely soaring in numbers here in California. A good number of those homeless uh, individuals suffer with debilitating mental health diagnosis. As I discuss the LPS Act, I will be sharing my son's story, and I do have a guest here with me who will also be talking to you about the importance of getting mental health care, suicide prevention, and other important topics. I think it's significant that I mentioned that May is Mental Health Month. I become more acquainted with the, the LPS Act in 2016 when my son Dejan became so severely ill that he was becoming 5150 on a regular basis. He met at most times at least two of the criteria, but once he learned how to answer the questions, he would be released. And so if you're not familiar with the LPS Act and the criteria, it's are you a danger to yourself? Are you a danger to others? Do you have food and housing? Dejan learned that answering these questions correctly would keep him from being involuntarily detained for his own protection. In July 2019, I lost my son Dejan at the age of 24 years old in front of a train at 4.30 a.m. Investigators are unsure as of the cause of death, meaning it could be suicide, it could be an accident due to the severity of his mental health impairments. He had schizophrenia, bipolar, and severe alcohol and substance use disorders. It could have been his alcohol levels. It also could have been foul play because I knew that my son was using and he owed money to people who were providing him with substances. Nine months earlier, my son was held on an LPS hold in a locked psychiatric facility due to being gravely disabled. He was released by a superior court judge against the rec recommendations by a psychiatrist to hold him for nine months to a year because the judge said he presented well in court. She let him go. No one ever contacted me. Um, my son told the judge that he would live in the mission, which he was very unacquainted with. The judge just let him go just like that. And this is very common. Prior to the LPS hold, the temporary one, my son had cycled through psychiatric facilities placed on holds dozens of times over a period of three years. I went through great lengths to get my son the help he needed because his mental health providers would not listen to my pleas. They simply would not act to get me the help I needed to get my son hospitalized to get him better. I went through court for probate, conservatorship, and an attempt to help him with his mental health illness and provider at the time, just despite everything of the severity of his symptoms would not help me. Even though they seen how far he had decompensated, they simply would not sign the medical documents. Even with the statement from a public guardian's office, noting that my son would not benefit from a probate conservatorship and needed LPS conservatorship due to several reasons. One was his inability to keep housing, Prior to the LPS hold, my son was getting evicted. He was crying, screaming through the house where he rented a room, leaving the stove on, leaving the front door open, not eating, not sleeping, walking into the streets in front of cars, constantly putting himself at risk of being hurt and constantly victimized by perpetrators in which I couldn't get him to listen to me about staying safe. At this time, I was his SSI payee and paid all his bills. So non-payment of rent was not the issue. It was his behavioral health. His inability to put up food, I would even purchase his food and bring it to him, and he would let it sit on the floor and spoil as he refused to let me in his house to help him put up groceries. His inability to take his medication as prescribed due to the severity of symptoms he was experiencing coupled with substance use. It's important to note that many mentally ill homeless individuals have a condition. My son had that condition. It's called anosognosia. This is when someone is unaware of their own mental health condition. They cannot perceive their condition accurately and they do not believe they need help. The condition is common amongst those who suffer with schizophrenia, bipolar, and other psychotic disorders. Many of our homeless refuse mental health treatment because they too suffer with anosognosia. And the way the LPS law is written, if you refuse treatment or you answer the questions correctly, then there's no one that can make you get the help you need even though you need it and you don't think you do. 
My son wanted to be an actor and he was very talented. In his illness, he believed actresses and actors were talking to him through the television, telling him to come to Los Angeles and he would be put in their movies. Many a times we didn't know what he would do. At a, one certain point, he had access to his SSI money. And I'll get into that in a second. So he was in charge of his money. He often threatened me and the family to go buy an Amtrak ticket and just go to Los Angeles uh, to show up at a studio where he believed they wanted him to be in a movie. The worst thoughts would be him getting lost in Los Angeles, end up on Skid Row, never to be found again. After my son was released, he was then able to get his SSI payee removed, even though my son's new treating psychiatrist wrote a letter to SSI stating my son had addiction issues and was severely mentally ill, unstable, symptomatic, and should not be his own payee. I went to SSI with a letter from his new psychiatrist stating that Dijon should not be his own payee due to the severity of his illness and severe drug addiction. I spoke to three different supervisors on three different occasions asking why they would go against psychiatric recommendations, explaining the risk. The answer given to me was because we have that right. They had no idea he had just been released and they didn't care. The physical doctor where Dijon went to a clinic in the neighborhood, he went to get a letter there stating he could be his own payee, even though he was on SSI for a mental health issue, and they accepted it. During the time that he was alive, behavioral health services provided to my son were very minimal, and I as a parent greatly lacked the support I needed to help my son. I was on my own with laws that did not support saving my son's life. Because he was an adult, I had no power to get him any help. The current mental health system failed him, and I'm going to ask that at some point after or during the show, you will find my son Dejan's petition at change.org forward slash my beloved Dejan. There you will find the story, the story that I'm sharing with you today. I'm asking you to please sign for change if you can. I think it's extremely important that when we step away from this forum on today, that we recognize that mental health care laws in California need to be reformed, a complete overhaul of the system. I believe early on, Dijon was hearing voices, not telling me or anyone else. I found a letter that he was talking about how depressed he was and how he wanted to die for a very long time. I had no idea because he would put a smile on his face, fooling everyone. He had early childhood trauma that he never told me about until he was 18. If you're struggling, please tell someone that you trust that you need help. I tell my son's story to help others. In April 2020, the Center for Health and Journalism reported just in Los Angeles alone, 60,000 homeless people with some form of mental illness ranging from PTSD, bipolar, schizophrenia, psychosis, and other diagnoses are amongst that population. A survey released in 2019 found that Sacramento County's homeless jumped 19% from the previous two years to estimate 5,570 mentally ill homeless persons in Sacramento alone. California is home to 25% of the nation's homeless population. Obviously, California homelessness is more than just about housing. It's just part of the answer. The other major problem is mental illness, which drives homeless people to live on the street. And the truth is, my son was on the verge of being one of them. You may be asking, why are they allowed to stay there? It's because when an officer, a doctor in an emergency room, or after a hold on a psych in a psychiatric facility, they're asked those questions. And if they answer them correctly, they're released. This problem stems from three senators, Latterman, Petrus, and Short, hence the LPS Act created this law, closing psych facilities in the late 1960s because of the abuse that was going on in psych facilities. They thought that they were doing what was right to improve mental health, but what they actually did was made it too difficult for families of mentally ill individuals to care for their loved ones when their loved ones suffer from a condition called anosognosia and they refuse treatment. The LPS Act changed our civil commitment process in California, and the outcome resulted in mentally ill individuals migrating to the streets from those psych hospitals count into county jails, cycling through emergency rooms, temporary psych holds where they're merely stabilized and then released to the street, regardless of whether they have somewhere to go or not. A continuous cycle putting individuals at health risk of death and more, like my son, stabilized and released. For the sake of the word, let me explain. Stabilized means in this sense, it means they have been off their meds, they were refusing their meds, and now they're given their meds, and they're stabilized, and then they're released on their own with no resources to take care of themselves. So I want to be clear, I'm not suggesting that we go back to how it was before, but I am saying that more metrics need to be in place. 
As Senator Morlock put it, one can avoid LPS hold for gravely disabled by saying they have food and shelter, even if it's a tent next to a McDonald's across the street. You're good to go. Senator John Morlock, who I had the honor of speaking to about my son personally, and who was working diligently to revise the LPS gravely disabled law, was faithed with enormous opposition to his SB 640. Senator Morlock, with the support of many individuals, including myself, made an appeal to put more metrics in place to help those individuals with severe mental di health diagnosis. But SB 640 was shelved. Senator Morlock was not reelected, and while there are many legislators currently fighting for other Senate bills to improve mental health services, unless we touch on the root of the problem, all of these other laws being passed are merely band-aids. Even Dr. Drew Pinsky, a California psychiatrist with many years of California clinical practice, has spoken out numerous times about this problem, stating that we have been giving psychiatric symptoms a privilege, not the person with the illness, but the actual symptoms of privilege over the well-being of that individual who is suffering and their safety and the community's safety as well. Honestly, I've been on both sides of this table as a mother of a severely mentally ill son, a grieving mother, and as a licensed marriage and family therapist, I have witnessed the LPS law as a complete failure on both sides of the coin. Currently under the Section 5150 of the Welfare in institutions code, a person can be held involuntarily up to 72 hours for assessment, evaluation and crisis and intervention, or place for evaluation and treatment in a facility designated by the county. The process in which mental health holds are upheld are ultimately determined solely by a judge, and they are a series of holds that follow an initial hold, 72 hours, 14 days, 30 days, and so on, until you get to the temporary conservatorship and then the permanent. It is important to understand that regardless of the psychiatric recommendation to hospitalize a patient, the judge makes the final determination. During the LPS conservatorship, the due process in court of law requires patients be given an attorney to help them get released. And that is the solely the job of the attorney to assign to your loved one to get them released. The reality is it doesn't matter to the attorney if the patient is truly well. The only thing they're concerned about is getting them released. Many argue that forcing someone with mental illness to get help they need is a violation of their civil rights, but I'd argue leaving severely mentally ill individuals on the street homeless is a violation of their civil rights and is inhumane. Dejan was a kind, gentle soul, a smile like the sunshine and could make anyone laugh. He is remembered for being among his peers as the boy who would hear everyone out and their problems to help them solve it, even while inside he was deeply wounded, struggling silently. He was gifted and talented with story writing and singing, and he was my gift from God. From here, I'm pleased to announce my guest, Katie Cunningham, who is the Chief External Affairs Officer with the Jed Foundation. She's here to provide some important information and will tell us about the Jed Foundation. Hi, Katie. How are you today? Hi, Michelle. I'm doing well. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here with you today. Thank you so much. I truly appreciate it. Um, can you please tell us first about the Jed Foundation and how it got started and the work that you all do there? Yes, absolutely. I first wanted to say that I'm very sorry for your loss and really appreciate you sharing your story and for all the advocacy work that you're doing Thank in you. honor of your son. Um, you. But yeah, the Jed Foundation is a nonprofit that protects emotional health and prevents suicide for our nation's teens and young adults. Our organization was founded over 20 years ago by a couple who lost their son, Jed, to suicide when he was a college student. So we know how difficult it can be for, for parents who lose children to mental health challenges and suicide. And our work is really focused on a few areas. First, we partner with high schools and colleges to evaluate and strengthen their programming and systems related to suicide prevention, mental health, and substance misuse prevention. Second, we equip teens and young adults with the skills and knowledge to help themselves and each other. And finally, we encourage community awareness, understanding, and action for young adult mental health, really in an effort to create a culture of caring and to reduce shame and secrecy related to mental health challenges. Wow, that's, that's awesome what you're all doing. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about the possible signs of suicide? Thank you for asking that really important question. So some common signs of distress can include a loss of interest in things that a person used to enjoy, being more reckless with their behavior, talking about feelings of hopelessness, 
potentially isolating from family and friends, a sudden slide in grades or performance in school or changes in eating or sleep patterns. And another important sign to be mindful of is when someone withdraws from relationships. So they might stop answering texts or showing up for events or stop scheduling connection with friends and family, as I mentioned. I think another thing to be mindful of is um, that if they're saying things like not being able to take it anymore, wanting to end it all, or wanting to die, these are signs to be really mindful of. Feelings of guilt, despair, or intense anger can also indicate risk uh, with someone. And if someone you know is starting to give away personal possessions or actively seeking access to or information about ways to die by suicide or posting goodbye notes on social media, it's really important to take action. And finally, I just also wanted to mention that everybody experiences mental health issues differently. So warning signs may vary pretty significantly from one person to another. In teenagers, for example, depression looks different than in adulthood. So with a teenager, depression is not always the sad, low energy, passive presentation that we might often see in adults, but instead teens who are depressed can seem more irritable, more impulsive, more verbally or physically aggressive than usual, and they can take more risks than is normal for a teenager. I totally agree with all of that. You know, being in the field myself, um, I, I have come acquainted with that as well. Um, lastly, please talk to our listeners about the importance of getting mental health treatment early and ways to fight the stigma associated with getting treatment. So I'm really glad you asked that because getting treatment and care is so important and there are steps all of us can take to increasing access to mental health care for teens and young adults and, and people in general. I would say that lots of science has shown that letting mental health symptoms go longer and or get stronger is not a good idea. So early treatment not only helps us feel better if we're having a challenge in the short term, it's also um, preventative for the future, for, for additional challenges that may come up in the future. And it's important to know that early treatment actually shortens the length and intensity of treatment needed for mental health challenges. And just thinking about the stigma that can surround this, you know, for all of us, just being willing to start a conversation about mental health can really defeat stigma and help encourage someone to get the care they need. So I would just encourage your listeners not to be afraid to reach out to someone who they think might be hurting or struggling, to reach out to someone that they care about and trust if they are hurting. And just, you know, reach out in a simple, caring way. You could say something like, I'm worried about you, or I've noticed you don't seem like yourself lately, or I care about you. It's okay if you don't feel you have the perfect words ready when you reach out. Just that act of extending yourself and checking in with some someone can be really, really helpful. And by reaching out and checking in, you're showing your friend or your family member that you care. And also, if you reach out when you're hurting or struggling, it helps your friends know that they can also reach out when they may need help. So um, just that outreach to those in our lives is really important. I also wanted to mention, you know, what you're doing, sharing our personal stories about mental health challenges or challenges loved ones may have had is a really helpful way to reduce shame, secrecy and stigma around these issues. Thank you so much, Katie. I truly appreciate you being here today. You just don't know. <laughs> um, I remember, you know, right after my son passed and, you know, my son's story falling on, seem, you know, death ears. You were one of the, along with Senator Morlock, who listened to me, support me and encouraged me. And I just truly appreciate what you're doing, the work that you do and the support that you have given me um, in my work. Thanks for saying that, Michelle. Yeah, it's been, I'm just so grateful to have been in, in touch with you these last several years and really admire your courage and determination and the advocacy work that you're doing. And um, also wanted to mention to your listeners that if they need more information or resources, we have a lot of free resources available on our website at jedfoundation.org. And I'm really grateful to have this opportunity to talk to you today. And and thank you again for, for sharing your story and for all the incredible work you're doing. 
Thank you so much, Katie. I really appreciate that. And again, that's Jed Foundation. Um, you can Google that. And if you know someone that's struggling or you are struggling, there is a suicide hotline that's a national number, and it's 1-800-273-8255, 1-800-273-8255. My next guest is worldwide boxing champion Mia St. John, who lost her son Julian in November 2014. She's here to share her son's story, to advocate, and bring awareness. Thank you, Mia, for joining us. I appreciate you so much. Thank you for having me. I know it's hard, um, and you know I understand, but is it, can you share your son's story, just kind of a synopsis of yeah. what happened? Yeah, so, you know, my son had schizophrenia, um, and he was formally diagnosed at the age of 18, and we had him in and out of facilities, in and out of doctors, um, trying to figure out what to do. What happened was he developed a meth habit to deal with his voices. And we kept putting him in rehab because what would happen was my son would end up in psychosis, homeless, and I would be searching the streets for him. And I would find him, bring him back home, clean him up, get him back on his meds. And then within a couple of weeks, he would go off his meds, go looking for meth and end up again in psychosis, in parks, in streets. And um, so we finally asked Department of Mental Health for help and I got conservatorship and I put him in a rehab and um, they neglected him. Um, they had plastic bags in the high-risk suicide units, which my son was in. And ultimately, that's what he used to take his life. Um, now, the facility was found guilty of neglect and falsifying records. Mm -hmm. And we had surveillance to prove this all. So we won in court. And then we found out that there were many kids um, that died that way, not just my son. And I fought and fought and just this year um, was able to make plastic bags banned in LA County facilities. Um, but it took a long time, it was a long fight. And at least now, um, you know, unfortunately it took the death of my son. Yes. But hopefully now, you know, we're able to, to help other kids in that situation. Yes. And, and this is why we do what we do, right? Yeah, to bring awareness um, of mental health. And, you know, th these neglectful facilities are all over the nation. It's not just L.A. County. L.A. County just happens to be the worst. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is happening all over the country. I mean, all over the world, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. And that's why I mentioned it wasn't just me not being able to get my son the help that he needed, but it was also the fact that even the facilities are not operating the way they should be and not giving the care no. that they're supposed to be giving. So it's like a total revamp of the system that is needed. Yeah. Yeah. They're cutting corners and uh, a lot of the employees are not equipped to deal with serious mental illness. Mm -hmm. Katie, does any of this sound familiar in your work? Yes, absolutely. And I just wanted to thank you, Mia, for sharing your story. As I mentioned earlier, you know, sharing our lived experience with mental health challenges and the mental health challenges of our loved ones is a really important way to bring the conversation to light and just reduce the stigma that can surround these issues. I also wanted to mention that your focus on means safety, you know, reducing access to lethal means is really a critical part of suicide prevention. So it's really incredible progress that you were able to achieve that from an advocacy standpoint and and to likely save future lives through that that effort around mean safety right it's it, you know it's shocking to me that it took seven years to do it um, with constant battling with the state of California and Department of Mental Health and so these kids who are in these high-risk units that and my son had attempted suicide a week prior. So the fact that they're still, 
the fact that he tried to use a plastic bag the week prior and that there was still a plastic bag after I demanded they be removed. And they said they were removed, but they weren't because the police uncovered the plastic bag still in his unit. Um, the fact that they're still giving them the tools to, to take their life is just appalling. You know, um, Mia, as we share your story and we're listening to you, we're showing some of the photos of Julian. Can you tell us a little bit about his personality before his illness? Oh, my son was, even during his illness, you know, he was a, a wonderful artist. Um, his first gallery was, he was signed to the Laguna Gallery of Contemporary Art, you know. So he was a very, um, you know, artistic beautiful, loving child with such a fun personality. And even in his illness, you know, and that's when he would paint the most was okay. when he was psychosis. Um, so um, these kids like with schizophrenia are brilliant, mm -hmm. you know, and a lot of them are so creative. Um, and that was a part of my son that I never wanted to get rid of. And Unfortunately, you know, that a lot of the medications kind of numb their creativity, which is what yeah. he didn't like about the medication. But it also calmed down the voices. So it was a catch-22, yeah. you know. It, it was good that the voices were gone, but then it also uh, kind of, um, you know, numbed his, his creativity as well. Mm -hmm. You know, my heart goes out to you because um, although we have different battles in some sense, we're still on the same team because we need advocacy. We need awareness. We need the system to listen. And I, I know you probably have the same experience as I did, that many politicians would not hear me. Um, you know, uh, I sent letters. I called. And I've seen that you've done a lot of interviews. Um, do you feel like you've been ignored to a certain degree? I feel like I was uh, by the state of California for, you know, the Department of Health and Mental Health for a long time. Um, and even with the lawsuit, you know, ours was the biggest lawsuit of its kind. Mm -hmm. And it just seemed like the hospital just took the loss, okay, paid out the money. It was just like back to business as usual. You right. know, with no real changes. Yes. And um, so, yeah, I felt like that's what these hospitals do. They pay out their lawsuits and they just go back to business as usual. Yeah. But that's why we got to keep fighting, right? Exactly. Finding now ways to fight. <laughs> and you're a boxer, so. And, and, and now that's what I do. My foundation yeah. has partnered with step up on second which is a the, one of the largest nonprofits in LA County and um, I do outreach for the homeless that are addicted yeah. uh, and have mental illness and so I work with kids every day that are just like my son and that's the only solace I have and you have an art studio right for the uh, no we did we okay. did that was part of our program. We had one in Palm Springs and now we just we have the outreach program right there, honey. We have the outreach program and um, yeah, that has brought me a lot of um, a lot of sadness, you know. Yeah. To see these kids, but a lot of joy that um, if I can help any of them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's therapeutic to reach out and help others. Very therapeutic, yeah. Yes. And then you have a new book about your I life. A book called Fighting for My Life. It's out now. And it's the story of, you know, my life as well as um, my son's life. Mm -hmm. I, I think I heard you once say on an um, interview that you thought boxing was your purpose, but then you realized that that was just creating a platform yeah it was just the platform for me to get to the media to get my story out there because so many mothers are not able they go unheard mm -hmm. you know 
and I was able to get to the media and and tell my story and I realized that that was my purpose of boxing it wasn't to kick another human being's ass Mm -hmm. Uh, it was my passion for so many years but um, it, it wasn't my true purpose in life I understand what you're saying. I, I feel the same way about my life. And I I vowed to the very last breath that I'll keep fighting in my son's memory. It doesn't matter what it takes. Yeah. I'm not a boxer. I couldn't probably box my way out of a wet paper bag, but I'm a, definitely a fighter. Um, yeah. And I'm pretty spunky. And uh, I'm not giving up. I'm not going to shut up. I'm not going to back down. And until I see some changes with the LPS law, they won't hear the last of me. Yeah, good. Thank you for coming, Mia. I thank you. I really appreciate your support and the work that you're doing. And thank let's you. continue you to collaborate. Too. Anything you can think of. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. I appreciate what you do as well. Thank you. All right. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. This has been Let's Talk with Dr. Michelle. I'm Dr. Michelle. I want to thank both of my guests for coming, and we'll see you next time.